welcome to the Acid Trash Jamboree, and to something I'm dubbing a black metal roundup, for which I've basically taken the nearest stack of BM CDs that I could lay my hands on, re-listen to them with a critical ear, and yeah, as you'll come to realise, what was supposed to be a quick whiz through umpteen bands and releases has actually turned into my longest video to date. Please stick around though, as I'm covering some cool stuff, so yeah, let's do this. We start with the album Islands by the prolific cult Finnish duo Circle of Ouroboros. This one originally came out in 2009 on vinyl and cassette, then got a CD reissue in 2012, courtesy of the Australian label Dark Adversary Productions. Islands is actually the third part of a trilogy, also comprising of the albums Shores from 2006 and Streams from 2007. And yeah, whilst I'm generally fond of the band's earlier stuff, with Shores in particular remaining one of my favourites by them, truth be told, for me, Islands is a bit of a disappointment. Yeah, it's certainly the weakest part of the trilogy, with little of the addictive, post-punky catchiness of their stronger material. Instead, most of the album kind of blurs into a dreary, soupy, dissonant haze, which sounds a pretty good idea on paper, but in reality it's just a bit of a slog to get through. I suppose songs like Green Grey Winter and These Feathers in My Hand are pretty good, taken in isolation, and the closing guitar instrumental is also quite nice, though whether they'd make a personal circle of a robberous best of is another matter. Yeah, not the best place to start with these fellas, by any means. Luckily, there's plenty of good stuff to choose from elsewhere in their catalogue, so the odd letdown can be excused, I suppose. At a guess, I think I have about half of what they've released to date. Probably if it wasn't scattered about all over the place, I'd be able to put together a couple of videos dedicated solely to the band, but yeah, that'll have to wait for another day. Now, Divisor is a Greek band who, admittedly, I don't know too much about, though it would seem they've been active since the late 80s, with their first demo emerging in 1990. This, their debut album, Unspeakable Cults, finally saw the light of day in 1996, though the version I have here is a 2009 reissue with different cover art and bonus tracks. And yeah, if you have more than a passing familiarity with the Greek scene, then you'll be able to pick up on that distinctive, somewhat dusty, ancient and grandiose Hellenic vibe as soon as this kicks in. The songs are very much at the melodic end of things. There are shades of contemporaneous Varathron, Rotting Christ and Legion of Doom in evidence throughout, the light dusting of ambient keys occasionally taking things in a rather epic, symphonic direction, and with everything perfectly balanced thanks to the clean, some would say sterile production job. Still though, there are some gems here. Granted, as with a few of the CDs I'm discussing today, it's taken a long time for unspeakable cults to really come into focus for me. Yeah, I've owned it for over 10 years now, and for the longest time it's pretty much just been a another solid but unremarkable slab of black metal, which does the job whilst it's playing but doesn't stick in the mind afterwards. But yeah, sitting down and really paying attention to it for this video has really helped in my appreciation of it. Yeah, in particular, the stretch from Darkness Incarnate up to the instrumental Ritual Orgy is eminently replayable. Alongside the polished production job, a couple of the songs feature that other big no-no in the realms of black metal, in the form of female guest vocals. Though instead of the usual over-the-top operatic stylings that you get with bands like Cradle of Filth, the vocals on the aforementioned Darkness Incarnate are so wispy and fey that they sound like they've been drafted in from some 1980s indie pop song. So yeah, chances are you may not even notice them. Regarding the bonus tracks, we get a solid stab at Bathory's immortal classic Call From The Grave, plus all three tracks from Thy Blackest Love, 
1996 demo that preceded the full length. Among these is a different take on the excellent Threnody, with a markedly more unhinged vocal performance than the album version, and the savage blaster 2000 Years of Lies. Next up, DeLorean, one of several highly interesting black and doom metal projects from Finland, active alongside the likes of Unholy and Worm Flem in the 90s and 2000s. That said, the album of theirs I'm covering today, their self-titled second effort from 2001, is probably the one with the least black metal influence in it. Though yeah, I can't be bothered splitting stylistic hairs for the sake of one CD, so I'm covering it regardless. Anyways, for those not in the know, DeLorean are like the musical equivalent of being trapped in an awful, shadowy nightmare realm where you're desperately trying to run away from some horrific presence or other, but you just can't seem to escape as your body feels as heavy as lead or like you're wading through thick treacle. Yeah, it's a highly disorientating and unpredictable sound, with sinister whispers and watery, clean guitar arpeggios suddenly blooming out into overwhelming cascades of doomy sludge when you least expect it, before amorphously drifting back into woozy, punch-drunk, funereal psychedelia, at times sounding like an old Cure LP playing at the wrong speed. Unlike most metal, where you can clearly hear the nuts and bolts construction of every riff, progression and transition, the pieces here don't seem to have beginnings, middles and ends. As I say, they just kind of unfurl at their leisure, like long spectral threads floating about in the darkness. This feeling is further amplified by the fact that the album basically plays out like one huge segway tapestry of pitch black trippiness complete with experimental ambient interludes. So yeah, on that note, it's pointless trying to single out highlights. That said, the last few times I've dug this album out, the penultimate track, the nine-minute epic Seclusion, with its gorgeously gloomy guitar figures, is one that always gets a good few extra spins. In my experience though, again, it took a good while for DeLorean to properly come into focus and reveal its excellence. Yeah, the first few times I played it, it just sort of drifted by without leaving much of an impression before dissipating like smoke in my memory banks. Yeah, it wasn't until I tracked down the band's third and to date final album, 2006's Voidwoods, which many consider their masterpiece, before I went back and really gave this another shot. It's been a while since I last heard it, but from what I can recall, Void Words is a bit more dissonant and less accessible than the self-titled, whilst I still haven't managed to grab hold of their debut, When All The Laughter Has Gone, from 1999, so I've no idea how that one stacks up against the follow-ups. But yeah, if you're up for hearing a highly dynamic, original and psychedelic take on metal, then you can do a lot worse than DeLorean. We move on to a couple of CDs featuring the Russian outfit Der Gervelt, a black metal project formed in the late 90s and headed up by Alex Kantemirov, who's perhaps better known for his time in the death metal group Tales of Dark Nord. This first exhibit is a split CD with fellow Russians Nagathrond, not to be confused with the notorious German band Nagaroth. Here, Der Gervelt songs, taken from their demo tape Revelation, are mostly quite lengthy, with lovely and atmospheric neoclassical synth or acoustic guitar intros, giving way to generally pretty melodic but still raging black metal. Odd touches of folkiness conjure up images of ancient, mist-shrouded battlefields and sacrificial bonfires, all the while with Kantemirov doing a fine job of shredding his vocal cords over the top. As I said, the initial three tunes are all quite long at eight minutes apiece, though they're well put together. The twisty-turny arrangements keeping things interesting without ever slipping into what you'd call progressive territory. 
Then, after a short outro, we get a bonus song, Nordic Power, taken from the band's other early demo, Nordlich Sturm. Yeah, good stuff on the whole, provided you're not averse to programmed drums, that is. Moving on to Nargothrond, their segment of the split, Carnal Lust and Wolf and Hunger, is even longer than Der Gervelts. In fact, it seems that Carnal Lust is considered the first Nargothrond full length, as it also got a standalone cassette release the same year that the split came out. So yeah, you're certainly getting your money's worth here. Now, Nargothrond is the brainchild of Sergei Lazar, latterly of the popular folk metal group Arcona. Whilst he did expand Nargothron's lineup for subsequent releases, lyrics aside, this one is basically a Lazar solo effort, who turns in a ten-part suite of symphonic and gothic-leaning black metal. Despite being primarily known as a guitarist, strangely enough, Lazar keeps carnal lust completely axe-free, with keyboards, synthesizers, and program drums carrying the tunes instead, while some, like the coldness of Venus, are just straight-up instrumentals, the kind labelled dungeon synth nowadays. Melodically speaking, these tracks aren't a million miles away from the aforementioned key parts that we hear on Der Gervelt's half of the CD as well as bringing to mind the early work of yet another Russian act, the severely underrated symphonic black doomsters Radigost. Lazar's vocals range from obscured mutterings and murmurings to occasional stretches of more traditional violent throat tearing, without which this would be hard to even describe as metal if we're being honest. Not that it really matters in the end, yeah, if you're at all into dungeon synth or black metal intro music, whatever you want to call it, particularly old school stuff at the colder and gloomier end of the scale, then this is bound to appeal on some level. Okay, so this one from 2003 is entitled Human Breed, and it's credited solely to Der Gervelt. Though, interestingly, a quick perusal of the lineup shows that Lazar had actually joined the band at this point, on both guitar and bass duties. He was also responsible for composing all the music here, which, compared to the material on the split CD, and by that I mean both the previous Der Gervelt songs and Lazar's own Nargothron music, couldn't be more different. The production is also markedly different here. Yeah, gone is that semi-mystical, intangible 90s roughness. In its place is a much more polished, streamlined studio sound. Again, which may come over as a little sterile and clinical to lovers of more raw and lo-fi metal. But more importantly, are the songs any good? Well, on the whole, I'd say yes. Whilst the album is still predominantly black metal stylistically, again with some rather unorthodox song structuring, unlike on the demo stuff, there's a pretty big streak of death metal running through this one, with way more of a meaty, weighty chug to the riffing, and in some of the rhythms. Kantemirov's vocals are also way more guttural and death-like than before. That said, there are several thoroughly goosebump-inducing detours into glorious melodic blackness scattered throughout the album. Yeah, I can't get enough of that sudden shift into blasting midway through a bleeding path, whilst A Shred of Me I Cannot Reach features some stirringly epic and icy lead work. Whilst the final two songs do seem to fall a little bit flat, coming right after a bleeding path's high watermark, on closer inspection, the title track closes things in a dynamic, dramatic fashion, going from moody, brooding doominess to brutish blasting in the blink of an eye. So yeah, since its release just over two decades back, from what I can see, Human Breed has ended up a bit of a bargain bin obscurity, which I find to be a great shame, actually. 
whilst it's not exactly something you'd hold up as a shining example of true top 10 black metal genius, for me at least, there's just something here that's appealed to me ever since I stumbled across Der Gerwelt on some Discogs browsing session or other. Your mileage may vary, of course, but yeah, on the bright side, whether you like them or not, if you do decide to check out either of these CDs, at least you won't be paying an arm and a leg for them. Next we have Au Commencement de l'Ombre by the French depressive black metal act Grimlair, another fairly obscure project that, for some reason, I've got a lot of time for. Now, unlike with Der Gerwelt's often rather jumbled up compositional style where it's hard to pinpoint precisely what inspired it, you can tell who Grimlair's main influence is straight off the bat. In a word, Burtsum. Yeah, soul member Cadavra has got Varg's desolate, animalistic growls and howls, and his catchy, economical riffing style down for sure. Luckily for us though, unlike with the million and one DSBM clones out there in the wilds, Cadavra isn't content with merely ripping off the slow songs from Philosophum for 60 minutes and calling it a day. Nah, he's definitely listened as far back as Burtsum's debut, possibly even the demos too. In all seriousness though, the guy evidently knows his way around the fretboard enough to craft engaging songs that hold up to repeat listening. The material here also occasionally bring into mind 90s era mutilation in some of the more stately and decadent riff passages and in its disgusting, decaying lo-fi ambience. As with the aforementioned Circle of Ouroboros, I suspect that Cadaver has listened to his fair share of classic post-punk too. Granted, it's caked in a bit more audio mud and filth than on other efforts of his, so it's a touch less noticeable, but one thing I like in particular about Grimlair is his excellent distorted guitar tone, which grinds through your eardrums like a massive rusted buzzsaw. Yeah, definitely check out the follow-up to this one, Self-Inflicted State and 2012's Tragedy in Silence to hear his six-string mangling in all its down-tuned, mid-rangey excellence. And yeah, whilst those two are probably better records on the whole, there's still enough here to make it worth your while, not least the stirring opener alone, and the evocatively named Lost Consciousness in a White and Endless Desert. Now, with ties to bands like Armageddon, Lick, and Londom, next up we have the Swedish band Leviathan, not to be confused with the way more known US act of the same name. Released by Selpsmord Services in 2002, their debut, Far Beyond the Light, is an album I find hard to sum up. Some rate it as a masterpiece while others feel the need to measure it against Rest's project, just because of the shared name, when in fact they're hardly anything alike. For me, it's just a very serviceable, meat and two veg, black metal platter, doing its thing and bludgeoning you round the lug holes in a powerful but ultimately very typical way. Again, the influence of the second wave of black metal looms large, Leviathan seemingly taking most of its influence riff-wise from Mayhem, though I also detect strands of Finnish mob Horner in places, as well as fellow Swedes dissection, particularly in some of the more emotive and melodic parts that crop up in songs like Pleased by Your Pain and A Timeless Darkness. So yeah, it's always nice to discover appealing, attention-grabbing little pockets of riffage like that in amidst the more generic ten a penny sections, which gives me hope that someday far beyond the light will click into place. Overall though, as I say, for the time being, this is just another one of those that does the job whilst it's on, but doesn't really linger in the mind afterwards. Anyways, I haven't heard it yet, but yeah, come 2020, the band did actually belatedly follow this album up, still brazenly calling themselves Leviathan, though it seems that since then, they've changed their name to Vreden. 
And yeah, speaking of no frills, meat and two veg black metal, here we have the debut EP from the now highly regarded Polish band Magua, entitled Presence. Having formed at the turn of the millennium, this two-piece band, then consisting of frontman and string mangler M and drummer Darren, had previously produced a couple of private demos, one of which, Power and Will, gained wide release via its inclusion on the monolithic Crushing the Holy Trinity comp back in 2005. Presence followed the year after, and yeah, it's a satisfying little 20-minute slab of, as I say, very plainly presented but excellently constructed and moorishly re-listenable black metal. Yeah, again, take equal parts classic 90s mayhem, Burtsome, and especially Dark Throne, and mix it with a big streak of Catatonia-style melancholy, and you have the basic ingredients of Maguire's sound. Beyond that, it's kind of hard to know what else to say. I mean, alongside M's impressive, phlegm-clearing vocal assault, the guitars grind away nicely with heavily repetitive tremolo lines and arpeggios buzzing obsessively over well-worn, tried and tested chord changes, while the drum rhythms vary from militaristic war pounding and folksy lilting to more standard issue rock and punk beats, as well as bursts of your common or garden blasting. But yeah, let's face it, this could be a description applied to literally thousands of other BM releases. I guess Maguire just have that extra sprinkling of secret sauce or whatever you want to call it, which means their stuff just stands a little taller than the countless other modern day second wave worshippers out there. Yeah, personally speaking, despite their complete lack of originality, this and their debut full length especially, just strike me as slightly classier takes on the 90s sound, ultimately with the solidness of the songwriting giving them that extra appealing edge. On to Wolfheart by the long-running Portuguese band Moonspell. Now, it's funny, I was introduced to this lot in the late 90s via the second skin video, which me and a friend actually used to laugh at. Consequently, I went round for years with the mistaken impression that Moonspell were nothing more than some dodgy second-rate industrial band. So yeah, it wasn't until a few years later, when I was properly immersed in black metal, that their name cropped up again, and I discovered that they'd actually started out playing comparatively much more underground stuff. Now, Wolfheart is still the only thing I've ever checked out in full by them. So yeah, beyond reading reviews, again, I'm certainly no expert on the trajectory of their sound, but it's evident, even at this fairly early stage in their career, that Moonspell were on their own path. Yeah, from the moody, slow burn drama of the opening wolf shade, to the pride-filled, defiant bounce of the timeless classic closer Alma Mater, it's obvious that if it's blasting and brutality you're after, then Moonspell aren't going to deliver the goods. Yeah, their sound is altogether more dynamic and eclectic, again classy even, with frequent clean guitar and ambient interludes punctuating the metal, which references everything from gloomy old school goth rock to ancient medieval folk dances and beautiful Iron Maiden styled harmony riffing. That's not to say that Moonspell can't get nasty when they want to. Vampiria, in particular, features some distinctly sour guitar work and badass double bass drum thundering, which will have you pulling a grim face and nodding your head in no time. And yeah, after crooning his way through the epic and erotic alchemy, vocalist Fernando Ribeiro really lets rip on the aforementioned Alma Mater, but maybe I'm just preaching to the converted here. Yeah, despite the fact that they never were the blackest of the black, at least not for very long anyway, it would seem that early Moonspell is still widely listened to and very highly regarded, with positive reviews all over the internet, 
and no doubt thanks to them occasionally returning to their roots in some of the more recent releases and enduring respect from all parts of the metal community. Personally speaking, this is another one that didn't necessarily hit instantly, though again, revisiting it for this video has really opened my ears to its qualities. And yeah, it's probably about time I checked out more of their stuff, though I think I'll still be swerving the late 90s goth industrial albums. Next we have the 2003 debut EP by Mortifera, the French title of which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. Now, as well as being headed up by Drakkar Productions boss Noctu Geistmort, real name Cyril, Mortifera are probably best known for having featured latter-day Alcest main man Nej in their early lineup. It's not entirely clear what he does here, presumably drums and maybe bass too. Though yeah, he went on to make contributions to the next couple of Mortifera releases too, including their debut full length, which this EP is ostensibly a dry run for. While said album has the edge, if only for the inclusion of the sublime Nej fronted songs, the tracks presented here are still pretty nice. Yeah, if you're familiar with Noctu's compositional style in his other main project, Celestia, this is very much along similar lines, opening with a gradually building instrumental, which gets more malevolent by the minute, then moving through a neat trio of raw and sloppy but still coherent and well-crafted songs, the last of which was re-recorded for the album in slightly superior form. For the uninitiated, the riff in here is highly dramatic and melancholic, again bringing to mind certain projects associated with the aforementioned Black Legions Collective, a lot of whom have actually had music released by Drakkar, whilst Geistmort's startlingly ugly vocals are full of pain and agony. Yeah, as with parts of the Grimlair CD I spoke about earlier, there's a certain decadent but tragic quality to this stuff. A morbid beauty, again carried over from the likes of mutilation, to the point where you can imagine it being performed by a couple of lonely old rotting vampires in some shabby dilapidated castle. And yeah, again, as with Cadaver from Grimlair, Noctu somehow came up with another of my favourite guitar tones. Very filthy and decayed sounding, but never to the detriment of the riffs and melodies, which somehow always managed to break through the layers of fuzz and grime. Whilst I can't imagine that there are many out there that would necessarily still be clamouring to track down a 20 plus year old bit of plastic with less than 20 minutes of music on it, beyond the hardiest neige completists of course, actually I still find worth in EPs like this. Yeah, as with the Maguire EP I just spoke about, there's something rather satisfying about their no-nonsense, no-flab presentation, and they're always good to just stick on as a blackened palate cleanser, if nothing else. We finish with a peek at three CDs by the long-running Polish act Slavland. Now, I realise that this video has already been a bit of an epic. Don't worry, though, I won't be talking about any of these at great length. That's not to say they're not any good, of course. Nah, far from it. Soul member Belzegore is quite the talent. Though yeah, if we're being honest, Slavland stuff is pretty similar album to album. Yeah, firmly ensconced in the pagan folk metal tradition of Eastern Europe. If you've heard more than 10 minutes worth of this stuff, then you know what you're getting into here. Rustic airs, jigs and even a few hoedowns, all played on genuine oldie worldy pipes, whistles, stringed instruments and percussion, lead into assorted flavours of metal. From grandiose, teary-eyed Viking laments, to all-out, frostbitten fuzzy madness. Yeah, of all the bands and projects talked about during this roundup, Belzegor definitely wins the Tendonitis Award for his services to high-speed, wrist-killing tremolo picking. 
Again, I won't embarrass myself by mispronouncing any of the titles here. But yeah, this album from 2004 is the earliest one I own. He'd already done a fair few demos and full lengths by this point, so I'm not sure how it compares to that stuff, but on the whole it's highly enjoyable, giving us just enough of everything in a little over 30 minutes. As I say, capped off with some stirring moments of high-speed blasting insanity to get the pulse racing. This follow-up effort from 2006 could be viewed as a kind of refined and slightly more mature version of what he was up to a couple of years before. It's still raging and fuzzed out when it needs to be, though here it sounds like Belzegor is a little more in control of things whenever he decides to go warp speed. It's also a fair bit longer than the previous one, with more expansive folk sections and a greater use of sound effects, so altogether it feels like more of a conceptual journey if you will. The next album, released in 2007, sees Belzegor incorporating a real acoustic kit into his sound world, rather than relying on programmed drums. As fine a multi-instrumentalist as he is, he evidently isn't up to the task of replicating any of the OTT blasting fits from his drum machine days. Consequently, much of the record is either taken at a slow or medium pace. The distorted guitar tone here is also way less aggressive than before, sounding more organic and amplified than the in-your-face, direct input tone of old, lending the album even more of an earthy, woody atmosphere than on those prior releases. All of this meant, however, that the album, to me at least, sounded a little more on the dull side of things, both sonically and in terms of entertainment value for the first few spins. But yeah, taken in isolation rather than played immediately after any of his earlier work, it does have a peculiar, foresty magic of its own, sounding genuinely ancient in places. If you've maybe been put off pagan or folk metal by some of the cornier, jollier types of bands, but are still curious and you're looking for a way in. In my view, Slavland play a much more palatable and appealing version of the style and are well worth a listen. As I just said, with a wonderful Dark Ages feel to much of the material that most bands just don't come close to. Okay, so I better leave it there. I'll no doubt do a bunch more of these recent listening roundup videos in the future. Though next time I probably won't cover as much in one go. Anyways, I hope it's been entertaining nonetheless and maybe giving you something to check out. If you're new to the channel, please consider hitting subscribe and please check out the archive for more content on obscure and offbeat music and films. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time on the Acid Trash Jamboree. <laughs>